What I said this morning in Bible class is that I'm, I'm pretty aware that we're here to worship God and to remember the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. We always have opportunities like this to have Bible studies and to have lessons and so on. And this is a little bit of an odd lesson, uh, and I recognize that, but I hope that you be, have begun to see the connection between our faith and these lessons. If I do nothing except be able to help people uh, feel more confident that the Word of God that they have is actually what God gave to them, and it's something that can be trusted, then I will have helped you. You know, it's I guess it's always been sort of a faith-building series, and we deal with an issue in terms of science and religion that uh, many people just don't know how to deal with. It's like it's, it's an overwhelming push towards general evolution, and I'm trying to give you some things that are going to help you on that. In the classes in the morning, I almost always did it that way. I almost did it. Okay. We're going to try not to make any mistakes on the recording. At the moment. <laughs> A lot of people are now talking about what science tells us about God. Is that better? What science tells us about God. What God tells us about science is that he wrote about things that no one could have known long before anybody ever thought of them. Hanging the perfect circle of the earth on nothing now makes sense to us when we recognize that we're floating in space. Um, the, the whole concept of artificial selection is back in Genesis in 30 and, and chapter 31 long before anybody ever thought about it and got credit for it uh, among scientists. The truth is that most scientists began studying the creation because they recognized that it represented something that God had done, and they had a deep and abiding faith in the Bible. But in our generation, people have walked away from the Bible and said, oh, that's silly, it's so old, we don't need to follow that. We talked about that this morning. I think if you were here this morning in the Bible class, you know, you can be assured that the Bible you're holding in your hands right now actually came from God through the apostles and prophets, and everything you need to know is there. Everything you need to know to work out your own salvation is there, but you will have to work it out. God is talking to us through the Word, but if you don't read it, you can't hear it. If you don't study it, you can't understand him. If you don't try to make application in your life, you will never understand what it means to be a child of God. So we have a task on our hands. It's why we are called disciples. We discipline ourselves to learn and study and obey. If God says it, we do it. And what we find out is it makes our life better. It makes our relationships with our family, our spouses, our church brethren, it makes all of those things better. Anyway, this, this is the kind of thing that people are seeing now. On a, on a magazine front, you can see how small that little red marble is. I've talked about this. I don't talk about the ultimate origins because none of us have a clue. All I know is that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when it got to the creation week, he began to tell us details about his power, how he did what he was doing in six days. I do not understand it all. If I understood it all, we wouldn't be here. God has never given us a word where we were not required at some point to say, I believe. I don't understand it all. I just remember when, when the disciples said to him, you know, somebody came to him and said, Lord, I believe, increase my faith. It's just one of those passages that leaped off the page at me. Because what it means is that over our lifetime, we have to go to God many times and say, I believe, Lord, but I'm struggling and I need for you to increase my faith. And that's what I've tried to do over this weekend. Okay? 
I'm not going to talk about any of this because we've already done it, although I do want to say this. The most common thing in our society now is theistic evolution. The idea that God created through evolution. If somebody's going to be religious, it's like, well, you just believe that God created through evolution. The problem is, it doesn't fit the Bible. If you do that, then you have to throw out a good portion of the Bible and what God actually said about how he did it. And the things that we are actually told. You know, so it is a challenge to the very idea that you're going to use the Bible as a guide in this life. Because if you can throw out one part, well, I guess I can throw out another. And if you start tearing out all the pages that deal with the creation of God, you're going to lose a lot of pages of your Bible, about two or three hundred pages of your Bible will have to be torn out because they contain statements about the creation. So you just need to understand that it is either correct or it is not. Adam and Eve were real. It's not a folklore thing. The flood was real. It's not a folklore thing. It's not some little story that they were telling around the campfires. Ninety-some uh, percent of the world now are theistic evolutionists in all of the different religious groups. They've shifted over to theistic evolution. So, it's a massive problem to be able to defend the Word of God as being the Word of God as it is and our guide in this life. So I want to talk about why I did not become a theistic evolutionist. Because i got to tell you, it was a real temptation. Let me give you the background. I grew up as an agnostic Christian. When I became a scientist, I became stronger on the agnostic. I had many, many doubts. I left the church when I went to college, as many of our young people do. They, they get caught up in the little fantasy world that we call school, which is not the real world at all. I talk to my students about this all the time. I never talk religion with them, but I just tell them, you are not living in the real world when you are at school. This is a fantasy world. Most people, well, your age, everybody having fun, you don't think anything can happen to you. A time for experimentation, and they make so many, so many mistakes. It breaks my heart. They just make mistakes, and it breaks my heart. But it is in the real world, and when they get in the real world, they find out that they have lots more responsibilities than themselves. Well, it was a temptation when I was 21 years old. I became a Christian without even knowing about this debate. So I was already learning general evolutionary theory because it was a part of my career. And when I was 21, I ran into John Clark at Expressway. John Clark was probably the most brilliant one human being I have ever met in my life. He had a library of 12,000 books which he had read, all of them. He had a photographic memory. His library was a shambles to us, but it didn't matter because if he needed to find a book, he knew where it was. Many times when he and I were talking or writing, he'd say, David, and this would be more or less at 3 o'clock in the morning in the basement of his house. David, I remember this quote. It's in a little yellow book about that big. It's on page 179 on the right-hand side. And he'd walk over and find a little yellow book. He'd pick it up, and then he would read me the quote. He was the reason for my sick sense of humor. I apologize, but he was funny. He did puns all the time. He came up to the car where Darlene and I were sitting at a Kentucky Fried Chicken one day, and unfortunately the bees were taking over the garbage can that was next to him. They were flying around him, and he's going like this, and he goes, David, to be or not to be? And I thought, this man's funny. So my sick humor comes from him. Anyway, John was a brilliant man who had to suffer Alzheimer's for 11 years before he passed away. 
the most brilliant mind that I have known, taken away in the last 11 years of his life. And the effects of it were there probably 10 years before. But he changed my life. He made me realize that he'd read all the books I'd read in college, just like I had, even though he didn't have a degree. He'd read them all. And he'd read all of these other books. He was just a brilliant mind. At that point, I was beginning to think that maybe theistic evolution was the easy road. And it is an easy road. If you are teaching in a university and you are a theistic evolutionist, then it is the easiest road you can take. Unfortunately, it is a road that throws the Bible right out the window. So I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about why I'm not a theistic evolutionist. All right? There are compromises. Okay, class, in the beginning, God created Darwin and Eve. That would be a, that would be a very good compromise. I can't quite go with that. All right? But the question of whether the universe began by chance or by God's creation has been on the minds of people for years. Naturalism has been around for years. It's just never been the popular view. Because the writings of the Bible were so powerful that most people could not set the Bible aside. The evolution of the organic world from the synthesis of the first complex molecules endowed with the faculty of reproducing after their kind to the most advanced type of life must have taken roughly within the past two billion years on our planet. All the facts of biology, geology, paleontology, biochemistry, and radiology not only agree with this statement, but they actually prove it. Evolution of the animal and plant world is considered by all those entitled to judgment to be a fact for which no further proof is needed. That's a pretty good summary, isn't it, of chemical evolution and general evolution, and it hardly mentions special evolution, which is what it is really based on. We've already agreed there are three theories of evolution, one of which cannot be proven, that life came from non-life. Which, by the way, if you push them, every scientist will say, I have no idea how that happened. Because even the classic things that were, used to be offered in the classrooms about these gas experiments and sparks and so on, they, they are really questioning those now. As far as we can tell, the atmosphere has always had oxygen in it. And that experiment was based on the assumption that there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. However, that's one theory. The second theory is that once life started, however that happened, from single cell to multicellular, to fish, amphibian, reptile, bird, mammal, and so on, that that is the flow of things. So you can save yourself a lot of grief if you just say, yes, I believe that's the way God did it. That's what a theistic evolutionist is. So I want to show you the consequences of being a theistic evolutionist. This is the idea. You see these charts all the time. And the question is, is this evidence or is this interpretation? And you might guess, I'm going to tell you, this, that this is interpretation. The evidence is different, and I'll come back to that tonight. Darwin's view of miracles, a lot of people have never seen this quote. He said, the clearest evidence would be required or requisite to make any sane man believe in the miracles by which Christianity is supported, that the more we know of the fixed laws of nature, the more incredible the miracles become. A man who was losing his faith, who was married to a Victorian Christian, who took care of him in his sick bed from the time he got back from the Galapagos till the day he died. If you have one of the classic editions of the Encyclopedia Britannica, the last one where they allowed the experts to speak, at least until Wikipedia, they would select the experts, okay, uh, and they would speak. There's actually quotes in there by Darwin's son, Richard, where he says, My mother was a constant companion to him and cared for him. And what was interesting was that that love that she showed as a child of God 
actually caused him to remove some of his anti-God statements from the origin of the species. It was only in the first edition. They never tell you that. It was not in the other editions. So, the love that we show to people will be probably the most powerful statement we will ever be able to make to people that a God of love exists. If you hate people, you need to change that. If you get angry with people, you need to address the anger and turn it into something positive. But each of us needs to flow with unconditional love that comes from God the Father to help everybody, including our own enemies and people who have treated us horribly. We must extend unconditional love to them. It will speak louder than any of the arguments that they will hear in their university studies. It's what happened to Darwin. And I want you to remember that. It happened to Darwin. He was not the one who pushed his own theories. It was other people. They pushed him to publish, and they pushed him to write, and then he backed off and got out of the picture. Well, anyway, we've talked about some of these quotes. This is just amazing. Did this just happen? You know, if you want to know what this earth would be like if it wasn't exactly the way it is, look at the moon. The moon is small. 4,000 miles across, you can set it down. It would only block out the United States or the Sahara Desert. Did you know that? It's relatively small. It has no atmosphere. Why? Because it's not as large as the earth. It doesn't have the same gravitational pull. It can't hold an atmosphere to it. It has water on it, about 8 billion gallons hidden in crevices that never see the sun, so it's not sublimed off that, off that piece of rock. Are we ever going to go live there? No. This is the most unique thing in the universe. This little kind of, you know, blue and green and white planet that we see from space. The Earth is the most amazing thing I've ever seen, and I wish I could just talk about that, but I can't. The more I learn about geology and science just generally across the field, the more amazed I am at the creative power of God. The facts do not force you to go to atheism or to theistic evolution or to agnosticism or to being a skeptic. The facts of science, if you will look at them in the light of God's work, will stun you with the intricacies of God's creation. Anyway, I'm stunned by that. I wish I was that man. I mean, I just really wish that I could have been one of those astronauts on one of those spacewalks looking down at the Earth. But I'm not going to trust in my own wisdom because I'm not the one who made the Earth. And I have to have something like that on if I'm up there. I don't think Jesus would have needed that. When he ascended into the heavens, I don't think he had one of those suits on, do you? So do you believe he ascended into the heavens or not? Do you believe he will come back and take us home? That's what the Bible requires. We talked about this just for just a second in the last class. <coughs> the Hebrew word yom, like yom Kippur, uh, yom is the Hebrew word for day, and it clearly can mean a long period of time. So people will go over to Peter in, in the third chapter of 15, and, and they will start, I mean not 15, but in that third chapter, and they will, they will say, it says right here that with the Lord a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. And that's true. I've studied a lot of languages. I've studied German. I've studied Spanish. I've had a little bit of Italian. I've studied French. I've had some Magyar, which is what they speak in Hungary. That was difficult. I've tried Arabic. I have not tried Chinese. I've had a lot of languages, a lot of Latin, stuff like that. And I've found that in every one of the languages, it's true that the word day can be a long period of time. But in the Bible, it seems to be modified by everything you could possibly want to modify it to tell us that God created in six literal days. 
The days are named. There's a morning. There's an evening. There's a light. There's a dark of the first day, the second day. What else could you put in to say, I want you to understand what's happened in six days, and on the seventh, I rested. There's nothing that could be more clear. So, what would happen to your belief in the days of creation if you were a theistic evolutionist? Well, you'd just have to tear those pages out, wouldn't you? They just wouldn't be in your Bible anymore. You would have to say, well, the days were long periods of time. They were epic, and God did this, and he did this. And they try to match all of that up, and it doesn't match up. You know, if you're a theistic evolutionist, the sun would have to come before the earth, but it says in Genesis 1, 1 and 14 that the earth was there before the sun. So you have to throw that passage out, right? They, they believe that life began in the water, but Genesis tells us that it began on dry land, so we have to throw all of that out. Anytime it ever references dry land, reptiles before fruit trees, it's just backwards. All of these are backwards. So which one of those are you going to believe? Well, if you're a theistic evolutionist, you have to change what you believe about what God clearly said. You need to understand that. You can't just say, I just believe that that was the way God created through the general theory of evolution and walk away as though that has no consequence to the rest of your faith. Because if you cannot believe this miracle, why would you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? Why wouldn't you just say, he wasn't raised on the third day, he'll be raised at the end of 3,000 years. At the end of a long epoch of millions of years. Why wouldn't you take that position in the New Testament? And I ask people all the time who are scientists, who are theistic evolutionists, I said, do you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? point blank, and they stammer, and they stutter, and they eventually say, I'm not sure about that. Well, I want to tell you that anything that leads a person to the point of saying they're not sure whether the Lord was ever raised, why would they be a Christian? Why would you want to be a Christian? If there is no resurrection of the dead on Jesus' part, the Bible clearly teaches that we will be resurrected. He was the first fruits of the resurrection. We will take on an immortal body to take care of the stupid body that we have here that just wears out on us. We end up getting sick and we die. I remember one time hearing a Catholic priest do a funeral service, and he said something that really caught my attention. Because the man he was doing it for had no leg. It had been amputated. And he said, now he will have that leg. He will be in a glorious body. And that is what the Bible teaches, isn't it? That people will have an immortal body. Doesn't mean you're saved. You'll get an immortal body, though. And you will stand before the throne of God. And you will either stay in the light, or you will be asked to leave and go into the darkness. To me, it's a fairly clear thing. Massive choices when we start doing this in, with our thinking. So anyway, I want you to think about 1 Timothy 3, uh, 2, 13 and 14. Adam was first born, and then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived, deceived fell into transgression. Our whole concept of sin and the origin of sin has to go. So can you pull, can you just go on and tear those pages out of your Bible right now? Just take the creation account out and anything that contextually talks about sin and how sin came into existence. You don't need those passages anymore if you're a theistic evolutionist. From the beginning of the creation, God made the male and female. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So you can throw out the concept of marriage as something that God created, an institution that God created. Because that's said in Mark 10, and if that did not happen with Adam and Eve, then there is no such thing as marriage. Which is fine, since 70% of people want to get divorced anyway, or get divorced now. 
a sadness in our society. A sadness in our society. It's a sadness in our society. And if you aren't sad about it, you need to be. 1 Corinthians 11.8 For man is not of a woman, but woman is of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but for the woman for the man. I'd love to get rid of that verse some of the women are saying. But the truth of the matter is, that is part of the doctrine of Christ Jesus because God gave us different roles. He just gave us different roles. He didn't say we were that we were inferior to somebody else. He just said, I've got to give you different roles. And there's lots of people who would like that to be gone. So just take out your whole concept of how men and women relate to one another another and are married and have children. Take out that whole concept of family then, will you? Just tear those passages out right now. Theistic evolution will not allow a finished creation. If you ask these people, do you believe God's done? They'll think about it for a while and then they'll be given to him and haw again. What do you mean done? I mean, if you believe God created through general evolution, do you now believe that general evolution is finished? And eventually they'll say no, because they don't believe that general evolution will ever be finished, right? It never allows a finished creation. So let's go back to some passages. By the word of Jehovah were the heavens made. Psalm 33, 6 through 9, one of my favorite passages. And the, all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the deeps in storehouses. On the basis of that, let all the earth stand in awe of Jehovah God. That's what that fear means right there. Stand in awe. Would you be moved if Jesus physically walked down this aisle? Would you fall at his feet as Lord? Do you stand in awe of what God has done? Let all the inhabitants stand in, in the world stand in awe of him. For he spake and it was done. And he commanded and it stood fast. The biblical creation is over. It's done. It stands fast. General evolution would be a contradiction to that. He would still be creating. We're not the final thing, are we? It's going to be something better. Eventually I won't be David Aiken. I'll be something better like Craig or Danny. Well, let me think on that for a while. But the point on this is I will be something better. There will just be something better that comes out of this. No theistic evolutionist can ever allow the creation to stop. But the Bible is very clear. In every passage, when it talks about the creation, it clearly makes it done and finished and standing fast. You can't believe any passage like that if you are a theistic evolutionist. So please tear this one out. And anything like it. Is that okay? Just start tearing them out of your Bible. You know, we really ought to do that, guys. We need to take the Bible and tell people why we tore those pages out and show them what's left. It's pathetic. There's nothing left. There's nothing left of the context. There's nothing left of the whole story that is there. There is nothing left that could give you a shred of hope that there is such a thing as an eternal salvation and a heaven reward when this is over. This is it. Ain't it sad? Have fun. Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die, and when we die, we're dead. We're dead all over like the old dog wrote. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Well, if Adam is real, I don't believe in sin. Take out all the passages that deal with sin. Don't really need that now if you're a theistic evolutionist, do we? Just throw them out. Adam was first born and then Eve. That's strange. Timothy and these different writers seem to believe that Adam was a real person. The 
genealogies of Jesus go back to Adam. Well, tell me where to draw the line between the not real people and the real people. If Jesus was real and Adam didn't exist, you need to be able to draw a line very clearly in those genealogies to help people out. Where are you going to draw it? Well, you probably do it right after Noah. Because you really don't want to believe that flood thing, do you? Anyway, there's lots of things like this that will be in here. I'm not going to read them all. But the point is, in Genesis 1.26, Adam would not have been created in God's image. And that means that you and I are not in the image of God if you are a theistic evolutionist. Is that clear? I don't know how to make this more clear to you. The passages just scream at you that you are different. You are not animal kind, some kind of accidental thing that happened among animal kind. You are mankind. You are unique. You have accountability to your creator. No other organism will be accountable to the creator. No sin. None of that silly stuff about Eve being taken from Adam's rib. Adam wasn't a living soul. No need for blood atonement. Not created in God's image. Then what were we created in the image of? Horses. Reptiles. Dinosaurs. What do you want to pick? Here it is, Luke 3, 23 through 28. Jesus, Joseph, Solomon, David, Jesse, Joseph, this is not all, but Isaac, Abraham, Japheth, Noah, Lamech, Enoch, Seth, and Adam. As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Oh, you can tear that one out. Because if Adam wasn't real, then sin didn't come into the world, and you really have, you don't have any salvation in Christ Jesus. Just tear that one out. Right, am I taking out some of your favorite passages here? It's disturbing how many things you would have to change or throw out of the Bible if you want to take the position of theistic evolution. I think most people would draw the line at Noah because of that story, but I'll come back to that in a minute. But today is really kind of modern science take seriously anything in the biblical account of creation. Absolutely. Yes, you can. Can a modern scientist seriously believe that this was all a natural accident? That your love for your wife, your love for your children, your belief in right and wrong is based on nothing? That you are, in fact, just stardust? The atoms of your body created in the Big Bang? Well, that actually would only create six of them. The rest of them come from the fusion reactions on the stars. Are you just stardust? Is that all you are? Darwin's view of miracles I've given to you. Let's talk about this thing that gets in a lot of people's way. Noah's blood. Okay? These are the earliest paintings that we have. Way back in the B.C.s of people dying in an ark in a flood. Very, very ancient paintings. There's whole books about geology that were written that sort of started the Creation Research Society. I'm not a part of any creationist movement. I'm a scientist who believes in the Bible. I stand on my own. I've created my own materials, and I don't need anybody else's, because this approach will help you. So I have stayed away from that. But let's not show our children a round-bottom boat when the Bible doesn't say that. It's a, it's a simple error. We didn't mean to do it. But think about what you're doing. You're establishing a toy, a round-bottom toy, with adult organisms two by two that they can take and put in the toy. Have you not seen them in the toy store? There are some really good toys that look just like that. There's no mention of a keel. This thing would flip over in a huge flood in an instant. So people have studied on that and they've worried about it. Oh yeah, I hear this has something to do with El Nino. That's one way to study about it. You just start making fun of it. You know, it's funny, 
but it pumps fun at the concept, doesn't it? Tell the cicadas to shut up with all of these huge animals up on the deck. It's funny, but it pokes fun at the biblical account of the flood and God having an ark that saved these people. There are problems with adult organisms, so I want to go back and talk about the ark. It probably looked like this. I've got other better pictures, by the way. I should just go to one of the better pictures. This is one of them right here. These better pictures that show this big flat bottom box. Yes, I still think it had a, it was more like a box on its edge, but that's a personal belief on my part. But look at, look the dinosaurs and the elephants and all of that stuff going in two by two. Now, if a girdle can hold a woman in, then God could have made this boat hold all of those things in it just as a miracle. But I'm not going to go that direction. What I'm going to say is, you need to remember that he did not have to take two of every species. Do you understand the significance of me separating out these concepts of evolution and talking to you about the difference between mankind as a species and hawks up at the super family level, and he did not have to take two of every species, and he didn't have to take adult animals. God helped him. It was a miracle. People laughed at him, just like they laugh at the Bible now. They laugh at the whole concept of no, who in their right mind would ever do that? It's just ridiculous story. It's just a stupid story. And God's love. God wouldn't have killed all those little babies that were left off the ark, would he? And all those puppy dogs and kitty cats. This is the kind of writing that you're going to find out there that pokes fun at the whole concept of the flood. This is, to me, one of the better models that I've seen. I don't do anything that has to do with the finding of a Mount Ararat ark. Even though one of my former friends who was a minister actually has become one of the prominent people in this. If that is the ark up there, it would be the first major artifact that God has allowed to exist that spoke of his miracles. We don't have the cross of Jesus. The shroud of turn is probably not the, the, the cloth that was over Jesus when he was laid in the grave. He was wrapped. He was wrapped and wrapped and wrapped. However, I cannot see. Look what happened in the Old Testament when they when they started worshiping the golden serpent. Nehushtan, they started worshiping the golden serpent. It had no power in, its, in and of itself. Can you imagine if the world thought that this actually was the Ark of God? The people lining up to walk up there to touch it, to be healed. Can you imagine what it would become? The tablets are gone. The gold of the temple is gone. Everything, God had it destroyed. We're not really sure where Jesus was crucified. We're surely not sure where he was buried. But it doesn't matter. He was raised from the dead. He overcame death. Mom just died. As her son, I would like to have been able to turn around like Jesus and say, Mom, arise and walk and have her get out of that coffin and walk out with us and go eat and get one of her Frosties. I'd have loved that. But she died. And my only hope is that there is a resurrection of the dead just like it talks about in the Bible. What's your belief? What's your hope? At the end of this life, you come through school, you get a job, you retire, you know you're going to die. Have you thought about what your hope is when you die? If you haven't, you're making a horrible mistake. You can't whistle past the graveyard. Everybody dies. 
There is an unsureness to when we die for a reason. Because if I knew I was going to die when I was 79, like my dad, on March 22nd, you see what I mean? How would I live up to that point? I'd be one of those selfish people who live for myself until March 21st. In the spring solstice. And then I would know I'm going to die tomorrow. Lord, I'm so sorry. I just put... That's the way people are. Death came into the world because of sin. When people die, it is because sin came into the world. Not because they sin necessarily, but because of the unsureness of this world. The randomness of death came in here because of sin. Not because of God. God is not punishing anybody. God is not evil. There's a randomness to death. When my niece died at 19 in that car accident, it was an accident. It was just an accident. I don't believe that God was punishing her or us or anything. It was an accident. Because when he said that everyone would die because sin had come into the world, there had to be some way to die, and there are lots of ways to die out there. It doesn't have anything to do with what God's doing to us. Things just happen. She wasn't on drugs. She was in Florida. She was on the superhighway. But I'll tell you one thing that happened. I finally figured out what happened. Her little Volkswagen had been into the shop three times because the steering column locked up. Now, why would the steering column lock up? Because some guy came in drunk to work after an all-night orgy? And he didn't do his job right, and she died because of his sin. It was a bright and sunny day. The witnesses said the car just went from the right lane to the left, and it just kept going into the median. When they got on the other side, this big Cadillac ran right into them. People have to die. Do I miss her? Yes, to this day. God didn't kill her. It just happened. And we've all been past it in our family because we know God wasn't punishing us or her. But it is a randomness. You have no idea whether you will be here tonight or whether I will be. It's more likely I might die than you just because I'm staying at Craig's house. But be that as it may, the point is, we have no, we have no guarantee we're going to get through another day. How important is this day to you? This is a chart that was put together that shows 40 different societies, none of which borrowed their religion from Judeo-Christianity. You have all of the Indians, the Assyrian Babylonians, you have Greece and Egypt and Italy and the Tilatuck Indians and Eskimos and Sumatrans and all. And they have a flood account. And I want you to notice what is similar about the flood account. There was a water destruction in an ark where human seed was saved. What are the odds of that happening accidentally? You tell me. What are the odds of that happening accidentally? Why would these people who did not have the Judeo-Christian tradition have the ark with human seed saved in a water destruction unless it happened? I've asked my anthropologist friends, if you found something like this, would you not believe that you had found something that represented people's cultural memories of the past? Because to me, the only way that you can explain this in all of those different societies is that a flood happened and in that kind of memory of man, even though some of the details were changed, they remembered that their elders, their fathers, great-grandfathers, ancestors taught them that there was a flood that destroyed the world and human seed was saved in an ark. These are not cultures that were based on our traditions within the scriptures. 
which means it's in the memory of mankind that this happened. I would be so excited as an anthropologist. So why has nobody picked it up and run with it? Because of the consequences. If this is true, then the Bible is true, and I am accountable. I don't want to be accountable. I don't want to listen to you, Stephen. Stop talking, Stephen. Kill that guy. They just stick their fingers in their ears. They don't want to believe this because of the consequences of believing it. But instead of being afraid, we should be overjoyed that God has given us so much to bring us to Him and keep us in the palm of His hand. This is the ideograph or pictograph in Chinese. Nobody has ever suggested that Judeo-Christianity ever came out of the Chinese religion. It is a vessel and eight mouths. I have asked my Chinese students, is this your pictograph for art? And they said, that is the old one. We have another one. That is the old one. And I said, does this mean, does that part mean a vessel with eight mouths? They said, yes. You want to tell me how that came to happen? Because in the collective memory of mankind, they remember that God, God got so angry with the sin that he saved the ones who weren't accountable by taking them home to him, and he killed the ones who were sinning who would have caused those poor children to go into sin and die in sin. When we get to heaven, there will be a whole slew of little children from 19 years of age and under who basically knew nothing about the difference between truth and error. And they're all going to be there with us who died in the flood. God didn't punish the little children. He saved them from sure destruction in hell. And if you want to know what the age of accountability is, go back and look at, at Moses talking to the people before they go in. And your little children, which you said would be a prey in that day, are now going to go into the land. And when you check the age, it was those 19 years old and younger were not accountable. Do I need to get baptized at six? Well, you might know enough to become a member of the church and want to be with your parents. All I'm saying is you need to understand that the age of accountability is longer than you think it is. God gives kids time to think and reason this stuff out. A vessel with eight mouths, that cannot be an accident, a coincidence. Now, with that on our mind, I'm, not, I'm, going to, I'm going to offer an invitation to you because I think we know where I've gone on this. If you want to be a theistic evolutionist, understand the consequences. Just start tearing pages out of your Bible. But the truth is, most of my theistic evolution friends don't study the Bible. They study science. They have made science their God. Science with a big S. They've made scientists, like Craig and I and others who are in this room, they've made us into the, into the priests. But who are the priests? Oh, we are, as Christians. We are priests. We are kings. We are fellow heirs with Christ. We have his word. It speaks to us. We obey. We live in joy because we have that. We try to share that. We will share recipes before we will share our joy with Christ, for Christ. We will share recipes. You've got to have trust. You've got to have this. You just got to taste this. This is phenomenal. You do this, 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 this. Here's the recipe. And then we won't give them the recipe for salvation. Kind of sad, isn't it? You guys have been really patient with me. If you are thinking about becoming a child of God, I don't want you to come forward this morning. I want you to think about it longer 
and come forward when the people that you know and love are here to accept you. I'm not going to reject you, but I'm going to turn you right over to them if you come down the aisle. But the trouble is we have enough people who are in the church who've got a foot in the world and a foot in the church, and they think they can do it that way, who are not thinking. They're just not thinking. And they certainly are not listening to God. We don't need any more of those. We've got plenty of those. The one place you can be assured that you will find hypocrites will be at church. Because they it's what they aren't the rest of the week, but they want you to think they are. But there are also in this room faithful saints of Christ who are living their lives to work for Christ and to work out their own salvation with meekness and fear. And they will stumble through this life, but they have the help of Christ. God never kicks us out of his hand. We have to jump. Otherwise, we are in his protective care every hour and minute of every day, of every week, of every year that we are blessed to live on this earth. Think about it. The consequences are monumental because if we miss heaven, as one of my preacher friends is wont to say, if we miss heaven, we've missed it all. We've missed it all. Let us know. We're going to stand and sing a song of encouragement for you.